beauty, it's everywhere. Whether you are in the mountain, at the sea, in the middle of the desert, or in the heart of the city, it's there. You know, when I say that word beauty, you probably immediately have some picture of what that means to you come to mind. Maybe it's your favorite painting. Maybe it's a song or a sculpture or a classic piece of literature. Maybe it's even a favorite film. Perhaps it's something more natural like a, like a rose or a hummingbird or an eagle floating through the sky. It does something to you, doesn't it? As a Canadian, maybe I think of green tree-covered hills while sitting eating bacon, while chasing it with maple syrup. That's a beautiful thing. I could even give you a dictionary definition of what beauty is, but it would be really boring, and it certainly wouldn't be very beautiful. But what is beauty? Is it something we just sort of imagine, or is it something more objective, like something is beautiful because it is beautiful. I think those that think that beauty is simply something that we imagine are probably in the minority, but that is the logical conclusion of materialism. You know, a lot of people really don't feel that they have time for beauty. They don't think that beauty is that important. They think of it more like the icing on the cake, or maybe a hobby that you do in free time. It's Garfunkel, not Simon. It's really not something you're going to spend a lot of investment on. It's sort of like, let's wait till we're done all the serious work, and then, maybe then, we'll have some beauty. You know, for many people in the church, and I think it permeates nearly every Christian group that there is, beauty is a distraction to the Lord's work. Like, there's no time for frivolity. It's too childlike. Why don't you just grow up already? Which is funny, because if you look back over church history, you see again and again regular affirmation of the goodness or the importance of beauty and creativity. St. Augustine declared that all earthly beauty was descended from divine beauty. Thomas Aquinas said beauty and goodness in a thing are identical fundamentally. Somehow this idea that beauty, creativity, and arts are inferior in some way has crept into our everyday theology. So because we sideline creativity, we're left with this idea that good Christians can't be artists and good artists can't be Christians. There seems to be maybe some moving on from this. We'll see. Either way, we're left carrying a lot of baggage. N.T. Wright says, the church doesn't have a monopoly on Keecher sentimentalism, but if you want to find it, the church may well be the easiest place to start. Or Gregory Thornbury says it like this, the Christianity is the greatest of all nouns, but the lamest of all adjectives. I'd say this, I'd say a lot of Christian art is about the theological equivalent of a Nickelback song. It's like we keep taking this message and these ideas and trying to cram them into something that just doesn't fit. Kind of like this. So what is art, really? What is it? You know, Leo Tolstoy, the great Russian novelist, he said this, Art is a human activity consisting in this. This one, that one man consciously by means of certain external signs, hands on to others feelings he has lived through and that other people are infected by these feelings and also experience them. It has also been said, art is primarily an expression of values, or it could be said that art is an expression of truth through beauty. You know, in both of these ways, there's that element of revealing self. You know, the artist expresses themselves vulnerably to the audience. They express themselves, not somebody else, or at least that's the way that it should be. They're revealing themselves in some way. You know, art is about revealing or communicating truth, and that truth part is critical. Because if we believe that all truth is God's truth, and that's something that we do believe, then all truth points to Him and who He is, and it exists because of Him. If there is no Him, there is no truth. But if we do know Him, then we can know truth. I know, 
It sounds kind of cliche, but it's true. All of this is not original to us. We simply reflect the original. This is part of what it means to be created in the image of God. You know, the ability to reason, to choose, to love, to emote, to perceive, and so much more. You know, these are essential capacities that we share with God. You may have heard it said that God is a DJ. And while that may be true, I tell you he is certainly an artist. When we read the Genesis account of creation, we see again and again, every time he creates something new, and God saw that it was good. James Spiegel, the philosophy professor at Taylor University, my alma mater, said that when God acknowledges these things as being good, he's not making a moral, legal, or political claim. What he's actually doing is making an aesthetic claim. He is saying that what he created is excellent. He's saying that it was beautiful, and he's even making this claim before there were any humans. So what that means is that before there were any humans around to, be, to behold or declare that something was beautiful, it already was. You know, beauty isn't just something that we have dreamt up in our cleverness, although we can do that. Beauty is something that we can discover, and we can know that it is something beyond or even before us. You know, God could have created a boring, drab, gray cosmos. He could have done that, but that's not what he did. There is ultimately no base need for things to be vibrant, colorful, and playful. It doesn't exist, but he chose to create with this incredible color palette. Only a designer can add beauty for the sake of beauty, and that's what God has done. He's created lavishly, artistically, elegantly, and in a way that is not in itself necessary. But it only seems unnecessary if you detach creation from creator, right? The problem is art reflects the artist. Creation reflects the creator. It, it must do so. It is an act of self-revelation, his character and personality revealed through his work. The Apostle Paul wrote, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Paul is pointing to what we know of all art. It will reveal something about the character of the artist who created it. Or, to quote the psalmist, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. Over the last 30 years, as humans who have seen images from the Hubble Space Telescope, they've been amazed at the beauty of the nebula's Orion, Helix, Eagle, and so many others. They see the sprawling clouds of incredible shape and color, speckled and striped. They are amazed at its beauty. God reveals himself through creation. He does that so that we can know him. And being made in the image of God means that we are called to imitate our creator. Humans are the only ones who are given this ability and this choice to freely reflect the artist who made us. And then God invites humans into the creative process. The first command given to man after the whole tree thing was to name the animals. And God said that whatever Adam named the animals, that would be their name. Welcome to the creative process. Even naming something is a creative act. When you named your kids when they were born or when your parents named you, that was an act of creativity. Which, incidentally, brings us to the next command to be creative. Be fruitful and multiply, said God. Go have babies and be involved in the act of creation everywhere else. It's the creating of new life. You are involved in the creativity of God. So when God commanded the nation of Israel to build the tabernacle as a place to meet God while they were in the wilderness, we read this. So Bezalel, Aholiab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord has commanded. 
Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Oholiab and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. So skilled, able, and willing to do the tasks that God had given. Yeah, and the people placed value on the artistry by actually investing their money in it. They kept bringing it. You, know, you could go on to read the incredible design in intricate detail uh, uh, how ornate this place would be. On top of that, numerous places in the Old Testament, people are instructed to be creative in worship. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise Him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to Him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. It seems to me like God likes music. I'm pretty sure his favorite band is U2. And then you jump ahead to Jesus, who John says this about at the very beginning of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And that's Jesus he's referring to. You know, so here's Jesus born into this world and spends most of his life as a craftsman who would have worked on wood, stone, metal. And that carpenter thing is just a simple way of translating what Jesus and Joseph actually would have been. He was a craftsman. And when he started his ministry, he continually taught with parables and painting mental pictures for people. And if he wasn't using those, he was using metaphors and symbolism, driving his disciples crazy. In fact, if you step back from, from Scripture and look at the variety of literary genres that are represented from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation... You begin to see epic narratives, both tragic and comic. You see sayings of wisdom, poems, hymns, apocalyptic literature using allegory and symbolism and so many other literary devices. There's art and creativity oozing out of its pages. You even in the Old Testament have Ezekiel, who's commanded to put on a kind of prophetic art, drama, as commanded by God. Isaiah, you know, wanders naked for three years in his own prophetic performance art. Don't try that one at home. The character of God is reflected in all creation, and we are to reflect His creativity by ourselves being creative. When we engage in creativity of any type, we proclaim the character of God to the world around us. You know, it is a sign of hope in a dark world, often seeming to have very little beauty, like right now. What Jesus is doing in our world and we are participating in is the reconnection of all that is good in our world to the source of why it is good, Jesus. Arts is one more area that is flopping around because its mooring came undone. It needs to have its anchor reset. Let's set a new way forward in the area of beauty and creativity. Ignore the stuff that is dripping with sentimentality and nostalgia and laziness. As Madeline Lengel said, if it's bad art, it's bad religion, no matter how pious the subject. The arts, creativity, and beauty exist because they are gifts from God. God is the embodiment of beauty. These things are tools to participate with him in his great artwork of restoration and recreation. N.T. Wright said this, Art, as it, at its best, draws attention not only to the way things are, but also to the way that things will be when the earth is filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. When we engage with creativity, we point to the beauty of God. So what are you waiting for?